Hello, I'm Howard Stableford, and welcome to the final episode in the series of Concept Cars. This week we scour the world once again for the new designs that astonish, delight, intrigue or shock. The Peugeot City Toys, that's toys with a Z, seem to score on all four of my categories. The Toys are a series of recreational concept cars invented by Peugeot's Style Centre designers. Their brief was to create futuristic cars which evoke passion, fun and pleasure for the driver and passengers. Here's the Vroomster, which has the fuel tank between the driver's legs. He steers using a handlebar steering wheel and along with the passenger is protected by an elongated windscreen. The body is made of carbon fibre with foam and is meant to be a tough guy's car and is painted in shiny black and flashy green. This creation from the toy box is called the E-Doll and is a bit wider so that three people can sit in the front. This doll comes with batteries included and it's a lecky car. Plus it has a carbon fibre shell, expensive to make but this electric car should really go. The side doors remain open, which wouldn't be allowed for a production car, and the driver, who's in the middle, steers using scooter-type handlebars with a starter, twist grip gas and brake controls, and a twin dial instrument panel. This is quadrophenia for the 21st century! The bobsled is a so-called engineering-free electric car with four-wheel drive and three seats, one behind the other, and a totally new interior layout. The structure is in the form of a sort of bathtub girder arrangement made of carbon fibre. On the left side are three longitudinally adjustable seats for the driver and passengers, all seated in a low position. The cabin, formed in this way, is protected at the front by a windscreen, then towards the rear it's completely covered by a bubble over its entire length, incorporating a glass roof. How do you get in? Well, the bubble tips up and on the right, a panel opens up a part of the bodywork. When closed, the bubble can be electrically unlocked to allow it to slide backwards, providing the options of a sunroof and opening side windows. Clever, eh? The car has neither steering wheel nor handlebars, and so you have to steer by varying the speed of rotation of the wheels. This is controlled by two levers or joysticks on a rudder bar between the driver's legs. I don't fancy this, do you? But what about this concept car from the City Toys collection? The Cart Up is a little bombshell whose lightweight carbon fibre body has two front seats and a V6 standard engine producing 210 brake horsepower. The occupants sit near ground level and are protected by a windscreen glass roof which forms a bubble. When this is opened, it tips up towards the front at the same time as the bonnet. As in all the Peugeot toys, the Cart Up is equipped with two headlights furnished with totally new technology. Each headlight actually contains a lamp which sends a vertical beam of light to a mirror which in turn directs the light in a forward direction. The reflected beam passes through a lens which disperses it onto the area to be illuminated. A mask with two openings is used to select a choice of road or junction settings. This design means that very little depth is required. Clever, eh? Far too expensive to actually produce now, but that's not always the point with concept cars. Some toys I wouldn't mind having in my Christmas stocking. The Ford Focus, one of Europe's biggest selling cars and successful on many fronts. So you'd think there'd be by now a mini MPV variant. Well, Ford were working on a car like this, but abandoned the project, some say because Vauxhall got there first with their Astra-based seven-seater Zafira. But we think the real reason was that they were trying to make the Mini MPV from the wrong car. The new Fiesta has got a lot going for it as well, and when the Ford Fusion concept was revealed, we knew this was going to be Ford's answer to the Mini MPV revolution. You've got to remember, the name of this car, Fusion, is something which came about because it fuses together two concepts. In fact, it fuses three concepts. It fuses number one, SUV. It fuses a car, like Fiesta, but it also fuses uh, together the minivan. And we really took these three concepts and fused them together, hence the name Fusion. Ford say they've really combined the best aspects of the Fiesta hatchback, an SUV and a mini MPV to become what Ford is calling an urban activity vehicle, a UAV. I wonder how many categories or subcategories these car makers can dream up. 
People who live in urban areas, they're usually in the know. They like to go to great restaurants, they go to theatre, they, like the, they like the nightlife, they like to think about culture, indulge in cultural events. And living in the city means that they want some form of mobility that's authentic, simple and practical. And that's really what the Fusion is all about. Reaction to the concept has been good, and the Ford Fusion will be on sale in Europe soon. Whether it reaches the States or not will mainly be determined by the engine, since the 1.4 or 1.6 litre petrol engines will be considered far too puny for our colonial cousins. If you look at this vehicle, it's got a nose to it, a proud nose. We found that was really important for them. They wanted to park the car, know where they're going to park. And also, the vehicle's got a feeling of presence. It's really almost a, a, a class to itself. The Fusion is intended to be a functional, not really a fun vehicle. As such, the Fusion looks promising. It provides the tall seating position people now seem to want, plenty of storage space inside the cabin, and a large cargo area once the 60-40 split folding rear seat is flipped down. The Fusion, another example of a concept transforming into a production car successfully. But if we want to see a very futuristic mode of transport, what about this? Looking more like a spaceship, it's actually a new design of airship, created by Charlotte Wilkie, who thinks that it's the missing form of transportation for the leisure and holiday market. It's designed for young professionals seeking an escapism element to their um, to their holiday, basically. So what it, what it entails is a short trip, say four days, and you, you travel maybe over across South Africa or Australia, and uh, the interior is, is a very large part of the project, and it, it's kitted out specifically for everybody's individual needs. Charlotte's airship is packed with all sorts of diversions for the pampered traveller. One level is purely for entertainment, so there's a cinema, there's a very large dining area, um, there's a huge resource library, both you know, physical books as well as electronic devices. Boy, try getting all that in your MPV. And it's also a real people carrier. The, the thing about the airship, it's so big for the number of people that it carries. As I say, it, only, it takes 40 people, but the actual airship, um, it measures 93 metres in length. And the square footage is absolutely huge per person. And for you petrol heads, or should I say helium heads, Here's the technical bit. The airship lifts uh, firstly through helium, um, which is contained within a large envelope, but 30% of the lift can be created through the actual shape of the, of the airship itself. As you can see, it doesn't look like a normal airship. Um, it looks com completely different. OK, it's got no wheels, but we think that Charlotte's concept airship is a gas. GM have come up with some great concept cars this year and none more gorgeous than the sleek, shark-faced Buick Bengal. It has a supercharged V6 3.4-litre engine that churns out a very handy 250 brake horsepower. It's aimed at a young market, but this car has a hidden talent that also makes it relevant to wannabe young again family men, rather like me. I think that it is in most cases with General Motors, uh, we do not do concept cars just for the sake of doing concept cars any longer. Um, every vehicle that we produce as a concept has uh, some possibility of making it in production. Maybe not the vehicle as you see it today, maybe certain aspects of the vehicle. Uh, this vehicle highlights a new technology powertrain. I don't know if you've he heard much about that. It's a front wheel drive, wheels forward, you know, that could be used in other designs that we do. A lot will de depend on how this vehicle is received to the likelihood of making it into production. The neat thing about that concept is that it allows you to get those beautiful proportions, as you can see by taking a look at the vehicle. It looks like a rear-wheel drive vehicle. The wheels are actually moved forward 8 inches because the transmission is mounted in front of the engine instead of behind the engine. That also allows you to get uh, better weight distribution for better handling, is, but, but the key is the beautiful proportions. The one element I hope does make it into production is that retracting tonneau to reveal the two extra seats. That way I could relive the two-seater days of my youth without feeling guilty about leaving the kids at home. From the sleek and gorgeous to the downright wacky, we'll cover them all here on Concept Cars. Plus, we'll meet most of the world's top car designers to find out what goes on inside their creative heads. Let's start by asking for their own definition of what a concept car actually is. A concept car is a means to an end. It's trying to get somewhere. And getting somewhere is to that real entity. And that real entity has to be a product that works and sells. 
and people with joy. Well, it's a nice two words that give me two sentences, concept, car. So concept means there has to be an idea behind it. And it should be an idea which is big enough to bite into to give you really a larger picture of, of stimulation and not just uh, here's a, a pretty corner. And car, so first of all, there's that basis. And second, it's car, not an automobile. Automobiles are self-moving. Elevators are automobile, right? Cars, cars are emotional. Uh, someone once told me, an automobile is what I use. A car is what I am. I think a concept car really has to show people what you intend to do for the future. You know, it has to, to a degree, be a test of how people's perception would be of a vehicle of that kind. You know, and it really wants to give people the confidence that the company knows where it's going you know, and that its products have an identity and a direction. You know, if it's just decoration, then I hate all that. I don't do it. You work hard with all the people involved in the project because the constraints are different with a production car to a concept car. You work hard with all those people. You make sure that the... There, inevitably, there are changes which are made. There have to be changes that are made. But you make sure that all those changes go in the right direction. I think it gives the, the public and the press alike a preview of what's in store for them in the future from that particular company. We like to think as, of it as we want to take our clients with us. They're driving today the Ibiza, the Toledo, the Leon. We want to give them a glimpse of the future so they stay with us. So we, we, we keep that uh, client and they say, all oh, right, I'll wait another two years and I'll buy that uh, concept car when it comes out on the street. That's the, the aim, I think, at the end of the day. We look at ourselves in car design now as product designers. And you can, be, you can have great fun nowadays. It, product design means basically a designer, he doesn't just think about a great shape, he thinks about what it would look like in production. It's, uh, it's a very complex job nowadays. It is, it is fun, it still is fun, but there's a, there's a lot more to it. You know, designers have to be engineers in their minds, they have to be marketing in terms of talent. So, you know, it's a lot more complex to be a designer than it used to be, but it still is great fun. It's not a painting, we're not producing a one-off. And some people do see concept cars as just a one-off painting. I'm gonna do this to shock you. Okay, fine, you shock me. Tomorrow is, you know, it's chip wrapper paper. I heard a very nice quote, maybe I can give it to you. I wish I said it. I can't tell you who it's from, but it's beautiful. It was, if you look for truth, you find beauty. If you look for beauty, you find vanity. And I think BMW should always be a search for truth because then you find that beauty that really lasts. I hate to say that it's, it, it's a gradual process. You don't turn up one day at work as a car designer with your markers in one hand and sweeps in the other and say, right, give me a car to design and then you design it. You start off on the door handles, and I did on the Chrysler Horizon, I did the ends of the bumpers and the grill. And I was so proud because, yes, that made it through to production, but uh, it takes some time before you actually do a whole car. It's absolutely brilliant because you can just free your mind, just see what can you do for the future, what is new, what has nobody has ever done before. So that was a main ambition for me, when it, my whole main task for designing Yenya basically. Our job is to see into the future, which we can't expect the customers to do because they're not trained and experienced as car designers. So we have to pick up more of a feeling from them than kind of design direction. You know, cars, what they are to you, is they, are they something you buy, are they something you lease? Is they something that is the same thing tomorrow as it was yesterday? What's the personality in a car? How dynamic can a car be, etc.? These are questions which up until now we've answered only by changing the whole vehicle configuration. I'm a convertible, okay, we can get rid of that. Now I'm a minivan, okay, we'll get rid of that, yeah, etc. That a car can maybe be dynamic enough to be more things to more people. Now, this is interesting. And that's only going to happen if we understand how cars are made. And when that change comes, we can begin to rethink that, then the whole relationship that we have with cars will change. There is a possible scenario where driving is so constrained and restricted in terms of the business of motoring along that if we still want to be in business as car manufacturers, we have to imagine that people will get different pleasures out of using the car it will have a totally different functionality. You know, it'll drive along on four wheels and have some motor power. We probably will make very few driving decisions. So we've got to have an opportunity to make all kinds of other decisions that makes it still fun to own one. 
That's all for part one, but here's a glimpse of some of the concept cars we'll be featuring in part two. Hello, this is Howard Stableford and welcome back to the programme. Finally for this series, I'd like to give you my own top ten of the bizarre, impractical and daftest concept cars of recent years. And number ten, it has to be the Mitsubishi HSR6, a stunning looking futuristic car but with little space for the engine and the angularity of the car would not score it high in the wind tunnel. And number nine, the Toyota Sony Pod. These curious Furbies on wheels can actually speak to other pods and talk to the driver as well via various mood lighting schemes, tail wagging nonsense and on-screen suggestions regarding stopping for food. At number eight, the Honda Bulldog looks okay but has a few daft ideas that I have problems with. Like, why would you ever need to transfer your sophisticated sat-nav system from your car to your bikes when you fancy a little pedal around? Would you really get that lost on a bike? Unless you were, say, in a forest, which wouldn't be covered by sat-nav anyway. And number seven, this Matthew Williamson concept customization of a Rover. A shocking pink and shockingly impractical surfaces as well. Would people really want to be seen in a car like this? At number six, the Rinspeed expanding and contracting car. It certainly gives you flexibility when you can press a button to get from two to four seats and back again. But at what cost? The heavy metal girders along the sides give it elephantine weight and also means you can't actually put doors in. Do. At number five of my top ten daft concepts, the 24-7. OK, we're not judging the Postman Pat styling, but the way that they've stuffed so much interactive and communication technology into these things, they've probably forgotten to put an engine in as a result. Plus, a nice idea to project colours and information on the dash, but you'd never read it in bright sunlight. And number four, another impractical system, this time the Osmos, where we're expected to give up space in our loverly cars to pick up complete strangers in the city. Now, car sharing is something we should take seriously, but not surely with people we don't even know. At number three, it has to be the toys we looked at earlier. They look great fun, but if they were actually to make these things to make them safe and practical, the whole fun flavour would unfortunately be lost. At number two, the Unibox, which is as aerodynamic as a block of flats. Plus, this greenhouse on wheels doesn't look like it has space for an engine. And do the occupants really want to be on show to the rest of the world? But at number one, it has to be all the daft creations we saw at the Ideas Olympics in Tokyo. From hamster power to great balls of nonsense, this festival of automotive frivolity had it all. The pink blobby mobile looks a bit of a laugh, and at least it has wheels on it unlike this. Well done to the Japanese for really brainstorming in a big way. Well, we're almost at the end of our series about concept cars and the heroes that have created them. But we couldn't close without looking at some of the astonishing creations of New York satirical artist Bruce McCall. His tongue-in-cheek history of Detroit's dream car era in the 1950s shows up the period in all its glitzy and materialistic splendour. 
What about McCall's Mom Chore Road Drudge from 1958? Now the lady of the house can take the house with her as well. Plus, of course, all the home chores that the all-American mum needs to do, like washing up and cooking, while the all-American hubby sits in the back room, smoking his pipe and reading the paper. Not PC, but this really is an MPV. But what about Bruce McCall's tribute to the fast food generation with the curbsider food hog concept car? This machine features twin motorised high-speed conveyor belts running rearward from grill level. I mean, why get out and use precious energy to go into the restaurant when it can be shoveled into your face by your car? Here's a concept called the Niagara. The purple front half looks innocent enough, but at the rear, there's a cascading waterfall. Hey, that'll stop them tailgating you on the motorway, won't it? And finally, here's the all-American patio on wheels. With a picnic table, barbecue and telly installed as standard, the Royal Patio Leisure Liner will certainly be a hit with the family. So, from me, Howard Stableford, and all the Concept Cars team, we hope you've enjoyed this series. And before we roll the credits for the final time, we must give a big salute to all the car designers around the world who are forever pushing back the boundaries to ensure our motoring is easier, cheaper, more involving, and more fun. Thanks for watching. We'll see you soon.